Hello, I'm Janine Shabilsky. I'm standing here on the UCSF Mission Bay campus in front of Richard Serra's Ballast, a towering sculpture of Corten steel, heavy enough, I hope, not to blow down on me on this windy day. I'm an artist, historian, a professor at the San Francisco Art Institute, and director of the San Francisco Bureau of Urban Secrets, a rather mysterious organization that seeks out, among many other things, the reasons why art appears or disappears on our city streets. Um, there are pieces like Sarah's Ballast that are here because someone put them there. Um, and we're going to look at several pieces uh, like that today. But also, there's art that we're not quite sure how it got there or who put it there. It's art that just simply happens in the city. And that's a part of what makes San Francisco so wonderful as well. So join me today on Gallery Crawl as San Francisco's own gallery podcast takes to the streets. When people think about art in public places, they often think about the big um, pieces of monumental sculpture that get put there either by public commission or by private benefaction. And San Francisco is rich in examples of both kinds. Um, we have a Percent for Art program, one of the oldest Percent for Art programs in the country. When you look around and you see something like that big, strippy, reclining nude over the parking garage on 3rd Street or the flayed car on the side of the 3rd Street garage. That's art that was paid for out of the bond money that was raised to build the Moscone Center. And that art is usually the product of a kind of public process in which artists and curators and neighbors and other um, interested parties get together and try to select something that will enhance the environment and also, frankly, oftentimes not get anybody too angry. Um, that's a little different than something like the Richard Serra or um, Klaus Oldenburg and Kuzi Verbrugge's Cupid's Bow that's on the waterfront. Those private commissions have a lot more latitude in terms of what they choose. Usually private benefactors oftentimes want their art to make a sort of statement about um, their tastes and their commitment to art on an ambitious scale. Oftentimes, on the other hand, when people think of public art that's publicly funded, they want to see grassroots things. They want to see things that speak to the particular conditions in their neighborhood and also support the work of local artists. And supporting the work of local artists is an important part of having an arts ecology. On the other hand, um, when we think about grassroots, one of the things I think that first comes to mind is um, very locally based mural projects. And San Francisco has a rich tradition of mural making that goes back on the one hand to um, the, um, the presence of some of the greatest names in the Mexican mural um, movement who came to San Francisco at one time or another, Diego Rivera being a prime example. And on the other hand, um, the work of artists associated with the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, under the Roosevelt Administration's New Deal. That work, um, like the work of the Mexican muralist, was very socially conscious, um, was very interested in giving an image of everyday experience, but in such a way as to highlight the relationships between, for example, rich and poor, indigenous peoples and colonizers, all of those kinds of complex relationships that, that go into the making of, of nations and cities. And that tradition was, has been continued to a great degree in the work of groups like Presida Eyes in the mission, um, in the kinds of work that you may see if you visit Balmy Alley or Clarion Alley. The murals also, especially in the mission, came out of a kind of idea that kind of overlooked or underutilized spaces it could become open air galleries and places of community expression. So it's no accident um, that alleys, for example, become great opportunities to do a broad variety of that kind of work. Um, nobody expects an alley to have a cohesive, you know, aesthetic design for one thing. So an alley can take a lot of different voices and a lot of different ways of imagining the world without anybody getting too confused by it in a way. 
One of the things that's happened over the years in the mission is that there's been a, a greater elaboration of the possibilities of murals, especially by artists who work both as muralists and as gallery artists. Um, artists in the mission like Barry McGee, um, Clara Rojas, Margaret Kilgallen, Isis Rodriguez, Andrew Schultz and others will do both paintings and works on paper and also murals. The murals are an important part of their work partly because it is the most public component of their work. It's what takes them out to the streets. Oftentimes they will also do a mix of what we call permissioned in the polite world, permissioned and non-permissioned work. Permissioned work meaning that either um, a city agency or a private landowner has, has given permission to allow a mural to be painted on the side of their building. Um, Non-permissioned work at its worst is considered to be vandalism and graffiti, but is also a kind of uh, grassroots guerrilla practice that can, can really enliven. I mean, I mean, we expect to see that kind of work in a city. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's interesting about it. And so long as it's in a place, oftentimes um, sort of retaining walls by freeways or underpasses, kind of overlooked open spaces, warm water cove being a good example on the central waterfront, um, places that become sort of freewheeling, not supervised, again, open air galleries where artists um, paint their imagery according to a very complicated unspoken code of conduct. Who you don't paint over, when it's okay to paint over, how long something should be up before it can be painted over. There's a very complicated conversation going on there um, that not all of us are aware of. But the Mission School, I think, ma has managed to be both a combination of a long-standing tradition of murals as a form of social activism and a kind of, almost a kind of archival project of being inspired by the vernacular traditions of cities. Things like old neon signs and certainly um, the sign um, 17 Reasons that is no longer in the mission is deeply mourned and often figured in, in mural work. All the kind of hand-painted grocer signs and fish signs, old-time advertising, the things that are half rubbed off of buildings. If you pay close attention in the work of uh, people like McGee and Schultz, you'll see the kind of memory of that coming through, the memory of a city of working people, a city with a maritime industry, a city where the butcher you would know his name and, and his son was going to be the butcher after after him. And that's been a really rich and beautiful part of the work that's come out of that group of artists. It's kind of the commonplace in the, in the history of modern cities to think about them as places of alienation, places where you're lost, harsh places where um, you know, no one will cut you a break and where people come when they're at the end of the line. And there's certainly a bit of truth in all of that. But cities are also amazing places whose vitality depends on the relationship between what's deliberately made there and what's, what, what is permissioned, what is official, um, what is constructed with a permit, um, and all the ways in which people try to counter that officialness with, sometimes it's a very small mark that just says, I am here. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit different than the person next door to me. And the thing about cities is they have an amazing capacity to tolerate all that difference. That's why they're such exciting places. That's why they're sometimes some dangerous places or places where there is a lot of you know, conflict um, between different, different people, different communities, different cultures, but also a place where all of those people, all of those communities, all of those cultures think they can find a place. Um, and so part of the delight of being an urban citizen is being attuned to all those gestures of individuality and inscription um, that are going on around you. And one of the dilemmas of those of us, I think, who are in charge to one degree or another of providing culture for a city, either by making it, by commissioning it, by being a part of a process by which works of art are chosen is that we're always sort of trying to figure out where the magic comes from. Does the magic come from being able to give a city a great work of art, um, like a work by Richard Serra um, or a work by Klaus Oldenburg, 
or does the magic come from a kind of tolerance for those those objects, those gestures, those marks that you couldn't really plan for, um, but nonetheless become a part of the rich and living visual history that is the surfaces of the city. And I think being able to, to walk around and take the time to wonder how something got there. Um, is it supposed to be there? Is it by accident? Is its beauty in the deliberateness of the choice or the accidental surprise and delight of discovery? I think that's what it means to be, to be truly an urban person um, and truly a person that knows um, that cities themselves um, and all of the culture and energy that, that they create are probably the greatest works of art that we have.